Thank you very much for meeting with me. And uh, uh, since this is the 20th anniversary of, of the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, I guess we should probably just start by looking at what it might look like 20 years from now. What, what are your plans? Bigger, better, even more attention to how we're going to be able to provide precision cancer care and prevention across our environment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, continuing in our theme, Paul, of translating fantastic science into the clinic and then learning from the clinic what the problems are that we need to continue to solve. The SCCA, as you know, is a consortium between the University of Washington, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and Seattle Children's. And so we always keep in mind the organizations with which we work and the fact that we're the organization that allows them to really translate their patient care aspirations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I guess uh, uh, just to do a quick overview of this, uh, to paraphrase Joe Simone, if you've seen one consortium, you've seen one consortium. Um, could we like kind of do more of an overview of, of what Seattle Cancer Care Alliance is, the numbers of patients, all the institutions, the catchment area, how fluid is it, how much room is there to go out, expand? Sure, I'll start. And I suspect Aaron can chime in with some of those metrics. Seattle Cancer Care Alliance is one of four members of the Fred Hutchinson University of Washington Cancer Consortium, the NCI designated cancer consortium. I, I looked up and to remind ourselves, Fred Hutchinson became a cancer center at NCI Comprehensive Cancer Center in 1973. And then our consortium was founded in 2002 or, or approved by the NCI in 2002. And at that time it was the University of Washington it was the Fred Hutch and it was Seattle Children's. And then in 2008, the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance was added to the Cancer Consortium. Um, and as I mentioned, the SCCA, the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, came about because those three organizations decided that they needed to found a fourth organization to serve as their clinical arm. So the SCCA was actually technically established in 1998 but we celebrated our anniversary this year because that's the year, that's the time in January um, when we opened our doors of our uh, flagship building on the South Lake Union campus um, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And who holds the, uh, uh, the grant, the NCI grant and designation? Is it Hutch or is it you? Or? Uh, the uh, NCI grant is House at Fred Hutch. Um, and the leader of our consortium is our president, Fred Hutch president, Tom Lynch. Okay. okay. He took up the leadership of that grant about a year ago. I see. Well, yes. Okay. Oh, Aaron, did you want to chime sure. in? Sure. Um, just in terms of our, our breadth, we, we serve about 42,000 or so unique patients each year. Uh, that's comprised certainly of, um, we treat our patients under treatment. We add new, about 9,000 new uh, patients for treatment each year. And so we're also doing surveillance and survivorship and, and other diagnostics, et cetera, around that. Um, bone marrow transplants in the neighborhood of 500 transplants a year. Um, and, you know, our service area, while certainly the, the tri-counties around Seattle and the Puget Sound is certainly a big, the dominant share. We do take patients from every county in the state of Washington, and we have patients uh, beyond our borders internationally as well. I think, I think that was some of the, some may have been some of the, your questions. So I wanted to add that color. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you have, uh, is there room to play with the uh, catchment area? Because some of the states sort of surrounding do not have uh, a cancer center. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, we are the only one in the state with the NCI designation, the only dedicated cancer center in the, in the Northwest. We look at the whammy region, which is Washington, Alaska, Montana, Idaho. And then sometimes we throw Oregon in for whammy. -O. They do have a, a cancer center at OHSU, but uh, we have unique services here that aren't in that region. So we see that as a draw. Um, tell you, we do have remote sites. So over the past 
several years, we've started to build our network. We have, we operate at Northwest Hospital north of here. It's part of UW Medicine now. We operate uh, uh, in, at Kirkland in the Evergreen Hospital. And we also have a medical oncology practice in Bellevue at the Overlake Medical Center. About three years ago, we bought a radiation practice out in the peninsula in Polsbo, Kitsap County. And we've added medical oncology there this year as well. So we do have, uh, we have, built this, this community presence to augment our academic presence here uh, in Seattle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Paul, the, the catchment area for our NCI designated consortium cancer center. Yeah. It's actually the 13 counties of the state of Washington that surround the Puget Sound. And that's because that's where the big population base is in our state, mm -hmm. right? Most residents of the state of Washington live in Western Washington a little um, sparser population in the eastern part of the state. Yeah. So uh, I understand you're planning a clinic expansion. Can we talk about that? Sure. Yeah, it's, a, um, it's about a $260 million expansion adjacent to the existing clinic. Um, we just broke ground on it this year. We're expecting to have finished construction uh, winter, you know, toward the end of calendar 22, open it in the spring of 23. Um, and so this really uh, is going to double our clinical space uh, over time. And so our goal obviously is to grow from where we are at 9,000 treated patients, uh, ultimately to more than 20,000 treated patients in a year. Um, and one, we, we with the uh, quality of care we provide, we certainly want to open the door to more patients, but we also know with the research agenda and the discovery and the advancement of cancer care, we need to have a pretty robust population of patients as everything now is getting more specific to the genome. You know, you need more a larger pool to be able to do the research that, that the science is really taking us to toward. Mm -hmm. when, when you say uh, treated patients, you, you mean index patients as well, right? Diagnosed with cancer and undergoing treatment. Um, and so, yeah. In yeah. medical infusion and radiation, et cetera. So it's, yeah, yeah that's a hard number. Um, so maybe we could go over some more of the history. Um, SCCA was, was formed at the same time as Harvard, just a little bit later. Um, can we talk about the rationale of cre for creating it? Uh, maybe we could like kind of go over the thinking in Seattle and Bethesda, like what was Bob Day thinking? What was Rick Klausner thinking? I, I remember Bob Day telling me this, but this was 20 some years ago and uh, I probably couldn't reconstruct it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Paul, um, because we are thinking about our anniversary, I was actually recently provided with a, um, a document from one of the civic leaders who recounted the founding of the SCCA. And it's a wonderful document, a lot of um, pretty personal stuff in there. <laughs> um, but, but I think that but what he said, and this is Brooks Reagan, who was a civic leader and who served as a member of many of the boards in town, including a member of the SCCA board at one point when I first arrived. So he went back and traced the history actually back to 1963, Paul, because he felt that in some ways the genesis of the SCCA was the arrival of Dr. Donald Thomas in Seattle in 1963. And you remember Dr. Thomas is the individual who was very instrumental in bone marrow transplantation, the later the Nobel laureate. And so Dr. Thomas was recruited by the University of Washington in 1963 to head the oncology unit. So that was sort of the first uh, beachhead, if you will, in town. Um, a lot of work that went on over the ensuing decades that involved interactions between the university, um, between the Fred Hutch, which came on board a little bit later, right? The Fred Hutch, um, I believe was founded in 1973. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, and then Seattle Children's, of course, which is a, uh, also a well-established institution in town. And so lots of um, interactions between those organizations over time as well as some of the other hospitals in town, um, particularly the Swedish hospital, um, where some of these things were located at one point. But basically my sense is that what coalesced over a period of years was first a pretty clear idea that Fred Hutch, which does not have clinical capabilities, right? It's a research center, 
um, needed to be very well partnered with a uh, clinical care unit. Um, the University of Washington, of course, wanted to maintain enormous strength in terms of cancer research and, and uh, care. And so that ultimately led to this decision to, first of all, partner together, as you and I have talked about ultimately as a cancer consortium, but also to come together over the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Um, a really wonderful history that reflects for me, at least, um, the importance of the science, the, the central theme for all of them, which was making sure that we had the best possible patient care. And then I think also it encapsulated for me some of the impact of the community in which you live. It, it was really fascinating to read about the community leaders and how influential they were in trying to think about this as they thought about their fellow citizens. And it also captured for me, Paul, the importance of our political process. Um, it reminded me that two really powerful senators um, in, in healthcare um, came from the state of Washington back in the day, uh, Warren Magnuson and Henry Scoop Jackson. Mm -hmm. And so those two individuals were really important, um, first for us locally, but, but you know even better than me, they were also really important for all of us when we think um, broadly about you know, their contributions to, to health, I think, in the United States. Um, Bob Day, as you point out, I think was a really influential person here. Bob um, was the Dean of the School of Public Health, as I understand it, um, and he became the, the leader of Fred Hutch, um, taking over from the founding director, uh, Bill Hutchinson. Um, so he took over, and I think that um, Bob was really one of the big architects here in trying to think about what the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center would look like. And then he was very important in terms of the interactions with the university, uh, with a number of leaders, in current, including our current medical school dean, Paul Ramsey, um, and also with a number of leaders at the Seattle Children's Hospital. Another person we really want to put out here is a critical part of our history for a very long period of time is Fred Applebaum. Oh. Um, Fred, as you know, was my predecessor. Um, he held the positions that I um, held. Um, at the time that these things all came together. And I was reminded that Fred, I'm looking up the date. Fred joined our faculty here in 1978. And so I think that he was obviously a pivotal figure in helping to shape all these things over time as well. And of course, he's still a very active leader on our campus. Uh, so we've just backed up 20 years. Maybe we should just back up another 30 while we're at this. Uh, consortia were there from the beginning of, of the cancer program. Uh, there was the Northern California Cancer Program. Uh, there was also the Illinois Cancer Council. And then there was also the consortium of uh, Howard, Meharry, and Drew. Um, and uh, then... Uh, in the mid in the mid eighties, they kind of fell out of favor at NCI, and there's even sort of a, something I've just uh, I just found out by looking through old issues of the cancer letter, something called the massacre of 1985, which was when NCI changed its its consortium, uh, uh, well, its cancer center um, uh, designation uh, requirements rules and. Uh, so something changes when Bob Day starts to uh, look at SCCA. Um, what is it? How did it change? Do you understand this? Because I, I ab absolutely do not. What happens in 1990-something, nine? I, I, uh, first, I, I appreciated the opportunity that you gave me to read some of those contemporaneous issues of the cancer letter about the consortium process. I, I had uh, not really thought about that history before myself. And Paul, I didn't realize that some of those consortia existed, you know, that they came and they went, which was fascinating. Um, I think that what the consortium has done for us and why Bob was interested in it, and I've never talked about it with Bob. I, I never had the chance to talk with this about, talk with him about this before he passed. Um, I'm guessing that, that the key here was that we had 
three originally, and then four, four very strong organizations, independent organizations between Fred Hutch, University of Washington, the SCCA and Seattle Children's that were all wrapped around the concept of optimizing cancer care and treatment, and also thinking about population health, which was after all Bob Day's specific strength, right? He was a public health practitioner. So I think it was that that caused them to think about the mechanism that would bring them together. I think it was also for us a mechanism to really think about some of the outreach and the population health issues, which are very important for consortia in a way that we might not have been able to do before. So that is my belief about why these things um, came about in our uh, environment and under Dr. Day's leadership. Um, great organizations with a shared goal where there was really a sense that they would be able to be better together. And, and I say that because that is actually the tagline for the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, um, mm -hmm. which is that we are better together. Um, the three um, key organizations, Children's, Fred Hutchett and uh, UW, we are better together working through the SCCA. So I think that's probably what drove it for, for Bob. I suspect another key thing for, for Bob was that he was a visionary. You know, that, that um, one of the great strengths for us is that we do have a really solid physical footprint on South Lake Union in Seattle. So we have the opportunity to co-locate the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance on one campus. Seamlessly, people can go back and forth. Um, and, and Bob was, had a huge vision to do that because I think that that part of Seattle was not um, in the best part of town at the time. Um, and now it's really quite a uh, amazing part of town because of course we're adjacent to the downtown, we're adjacent to the Amazon headquarters. I mean, there's a lot going on in South Lake Union. So I think it also probably was a catalytic force for him to think about how we could come together um, physically and then how that physical co-location would also help us to really have an amazing um, footprint clinically and um, from an academic and a research point of view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But what about Boston? The same thing is happening in Boston at that same time. Uh, what's, I, these are two data points. I have no idea how to connect them. Do you know? You know, I, I don't know, Paul, I was a, a medical student in Boston um, before that time, um, and I didn't really follow it as they were developing. I suspect it's part of the same thing, that, you know, you have a lot of really strong independent organizations who come together and realize that they can be better together than they are separately. Um, and so I, I wonder whether that's allowed, what allowed the Farber and the Brigham and, you know, the general um, to come together as part of the dana farber Harvard. Dana Farber Harvard Cancer Center. Well, there had to be some pressure from NCI. Also, the other uh, the other piece of it is is that when the consortia were out of favor, as uh, they were falling out of favor, the uh, the the uh, idea was that they're much better for cancer control than for cancer research. But um, that that also fit, feeds into, of course, what Bob Day would be thinking because he was thinking cancer control. Absolutely, you know, Fred Hutch has an enormous public health division, um, and that I think really um, is something that is a, a key feature of our consortium cancer center, and it's something that I think that we in oncology need to be increasingly thinking about. You know, the pre-diagnostic sphere, the the screening sphere, mm -hmm. um, and then the prevention sphere. Um, and then, of course, all the things that come after a cancer diagnosis, right? The survivorship part of life as well. So it was, yeah. Um, how does the future uh, of the consortium model look like to you now? Uh, I mean, you and I both could rattle off names of, uh, of, con of our institutions that are considering some sort of a form of a consortium, probably not exactly like yours. Uh, and if... Can one put together a collaboration working across state lines, even really, why not across the oceans if you wanted to? Um, do you have advice to people who might be contemplating such plans? Paul, I, I don't think I'm presumptuous enough to think that I would be able to advise others about how they might do this. I, I do think that, that some degree of 
co-location being together in a, a geographical catchment area is an important part of the footprint. Now I know my Georgetown colleagues have partnered very effectively with Hackensack um, and they're obviously um, not contiguous with each other. Um, but but I, I do think that's a, a big strength for many cancer centers because it allows them to, first of all, have all the opportunities for physical co-location for their research, um, but also it allows them to provide comprehensive care to a patient population um, that, that is in a, a geographical area. I, I think the size could vary. Um, it, as Aaron mentioned to you, we, we feel like you know, we're partnered with our colleagues in Alaska. Mm -hmm. um, we feel pretty close to the folks who work in I Idaho and Montana um, and Wyoming as part of the WAMI region, which is a construct that, you know, comes out of our, um, our universities, out of our medical school. Um, I, in the documents that you read, I, I, I sent me, I, I read this interesting in, um, discussion about whether or not Oregon, you know, should be part of this cancer center. Um, and, and I think, you know, the other thing that happens, of course, is as populations grow, um, is that, that places develop their own cancer center, which speaks to the interests of their particular locale. And, and of course, our OHSU colleagues um, were able to do that very successfully. This is, these were documents I sent you from- The cancer from letters. The 80s, yes. Yeah. The, the old cancer letters and the discussions yes. going back to the 70s. Yeah. Center. So I, I personally think it's going to be a little bit harder to do with time, mostly because we have a lot of really strong cancer centers um, that are going to want to be able to, you know, um, work effectively with their populations and their academic centers. Um, that, that, I think, is one of the great products of the cancer center program, honestly, is that, you know, this country now has dozens of really strong cancer centers and that they are pretty strategically placed across the country. Um, I don't know um, about the, the value of saying that, you know, you would have two groups that are very, very physically dislocated from each other um, come together. I can imagine there might be strategic reasons to want to do it. One would hope, though, that the overarching goal ultimately would be because you think that you would be able to um, do better research and provide better care because you're doing this together um, and that you're the best possible partners to do that. I do think the National Cancer Institute looks at this pretty routinely, and, and, and I wonder if you've had a chance to talk with Henry um, Cialino yeah, in the recent past about what the, the thinking is um, going forward about the consortium centers. I, I think what I can say for our center, and I say this as a, a relative newcomer who had absolutely no role in any of this, right, who came in to be kind of the beneficiary and, and you know, the opportunity to, to stand on the, the accomplishments of these giants and to, you know, be able to step into what they've been able to build. I think the consortium process was, was pivotal. I think it really did allow the opportunity for these originally three and now four really strong organizations that are separately constituted but with a singular focus on cancer or a major focus on cancer, certainly the Children's Hospital and the University of Washington focus on other than cancer as well, but, but to allow them to really have a, you know, a, a, something that allows us to catalyze our, our cancer efforts across the board. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Um, well, I guess since you've mentioned NCI and, and Henry, uh, the five and seven rule uh, is kind of one of the things that they think about. You have to have seven, uh, well, five investigators for, uh, were holding seven grants at least in order to be a part of the cancer uh, of, a, of, a, of a recognized consortium. Um, so obviously your consortium institutions have no problems with fulfilling this requirement, but you've been around cancer centers for, Quite a, quite a long time. And do you think this rule makes sense? And why, why not put together an organization that has no clinical mission with say an organization that has no basic science, but is massive, has a massive clinical capacity and why not call it a consortium? Why not just cobble something together? Uh, I'm just asking this without really, I have no opinion on the subject, I, I, but 
because I'm not entitled to it, but you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, the opinion that matters is that of the National Cancer Institute. Um, I, I guess my thought would be that uh, uh, one should think very hard about what one wants to accomplish. If there's going to be a true bridge, a true interchange, maybe it could be considered. But, but I, I think one thing I'm sure that all of us want to avoid is the, uh, you know, a clinical system, for example, deciding that they're going to make this alliance as a way of trying to enhance their brand yeah. but at, without necessarily a major commitment to the, the mission. Right to that which is um, so intrinsic to what we're all trying to accomplish, thanks to the support of the NCI. So that would be my concern: is that you'd really have to have a true collaboration, and you'd have to have the, the sense that that it's that this relationship would would accomplish what it's supposed to accomplish, which is to do phenomenal science that translates into improved well-being for individuals who have cancer. Mm -hmm. And then it translates, you know, across the environment that it's obviously that these benefits are hopefully appreciated by everyone, right? That we achieve true equity in terms of our cancer outreach and care. Mm. Mm, that's fascinating. Um, um, how, um, how do you set quality measures across all sites? Um, how do you Use, do you use pathways? What, what, how does it work actually? Well, quality, so we have two um, big pots of practice. We've got our community sites that I described earlier with, with the community-based faculty and they have quality measures around the work they're doing. We're, we're working to align all of that. They're all, um, and then we have our broader quality um, metrics around our South Lake Union practice. And we, so we have an executive quality committee that brings representatives from all these forums together and they meet monthly and uh, review our progress on things and, and our performance against our metrics. We have a dashboard that goes to our board quality committee with, um, I couldn't tell you the count specifically, but 20-ish measures uh, that where we set standards for each year and measure our progress against them. And, um, and it's constant work when you think about the academic oriented group at South Lake Union and the community oriented group at the community to, to bring these two groups together around a common set of measures. And there's commonality and there are differences too that reflect what's going on in those, those settings. Um, so that, that's kind of the how. Um, was there some other piece of the question? I don't want to miss something here. No, no, this is, I mean, do you use, so you use pathways or? Ah, pathways, that's right. Um, we, we had actually started working on that uh, several years ago, investing money to develop our own pathways. And at the same time, I know the NC, NCCN has built guidelines. And so we, we did all this work on these things and our, our, I think our IT structures, we got to a place of saying, is this something we should be continuing to invest in our own build or should we be looking at industry built pathways? And we came to the conclusion that the ones out there already are gonna be a lower cost to utilize going forward. Now, sprinkle in Epic. We just, as an organization, went live and converted to Epic platform uh, last month. Been a two year adventure to build this with the University of Washington and, and deploy it. So we've now deployed that. And so we said, let's hold our pathway decision so we get through Epic and then we'll come back to the commercially available products and bring those in. We've had a lot of discussion with our faculty around the kinds of pathways for their patients because we were building our own. We've kind of set that on a hiatus. We're gonna bring a commercial product in to support that. Um, I'm not sure the exact timeline on it, but now that we've gotten past Epic, we're gonna come back to that and, and then we'll be able to um, administer a pathway-based uh, wow. process. Well, one thing to remember is that the SCCA is one of those um, dedicated cancer centers. It's a PPS exempt group, right? So we have uh, 20 inpatient beds that we own and uh, run at the University of Washington Medical Center. And then we have, of course, our very large outpatient practice, um, not only in South Lake Union, but at the community sites that, that uh, Aaron already described for you. So intrinsic in that for us as an independent organization is an incredible attention to quality, right? That's part of what we need to do. Mm -hmm. 
That's fascinating, of course. But the um, how do you make decisions on clinical trials? Which ones to have? I mean, which sites would get them? Uh, how do you distribute resources? I mean, this can't possibly be an easy thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> the clinical trial uh, resource, of course, a lot of those things are overseen by the, cons the Consortium Cancer Center, right, as part of the Cancer Center process. So we have all of the usual mechanisms in place that you would see in an NCI-designated comprehensive cancer center, PRMS, all that. You know, um, the, I think one of the things that is really wonderful here, though, Paul, is that there are a lot of very, very gifted investigators. Um, and by and large, they are organized in disease-specific teams. And so the teams are self-managed in terms of deciding what they think are the top priorities uh, for their research that they want to take forward, the things that are going to be the most important for the patients in our region or the patients that we serve, the things that are the most important from a scientific point of view, things that come out of our own science. Um, and so a lot of that prioritization is done at the individual, you know, the group investigators, the group of investigators. Um, you're right that at the, the overarching uh, level, you know, I think that our cancer center uses the same priorities that most do, which is that we're incredibly focused on things that are gonna be relevant to our catchment area, relevant to our patients, things that try to develop our own science um, and things that try to help us really move forward, uh, you know, progress in cancer care. So I think it's worked pretty well. Um, it is largely a faculty driven process and I think the faculty are pretty good at putting this together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, is there a strategy for understanding the catchment area needs and aligning clinical research and clinical and outreach priorities to the needs? Absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the newer initiatives in the cancer center world, as you know, is the, the focus on the offices of, of catchment um, engagement and, and uh, uh, community engagement. Um, and so our consortium office is led by Jay Mendoza. Um, Jay is a pediatrician by trade, uh, but he helps us to oversee this. And so we have, as many cancer centers have done, taken a really, really deep dive into our catchment area to understand what's going on in our catchment area, what the needs are in our community. Um, and having brought that back, um, we're busy trying to make sure that our programs really do address the needs in our community. Um, we are obviously a, a cancer center that has um, a largely urban population, if you look at our Puget Sound counties, but a state that has substantial rural populations as well. Um, we're an area where uh, the minority populations include our African American populations, Asian Americans, um, and also Native Americans, um, indigenous peoples. And so we've worked pretty hard to try to understand the, the footprint of cancer across all of our populations, to understand exactly where the gaps are so that we can make sure that we're paying attention to those things that are really issues within our catchment area. So uh, is there anything we've missed? Anything you'd like to add? We thank you for the opportunity to, to celebrate more publicly. Um, the accomplishments of the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance at the time of the 20th anniversary of opening its doors, but more importantly, um, to celebrate the Fred Hutch University of Washington Cancer Consortium um, and all it's been able to accomplish over its decades in, in existence. Um, you know, we're known a lot for our bone marrow transplant, which is where we started, but we are so much bigger than bone marrow transplant and hematologic malignancies right now. Obviously, we maintain our strength in those areas, CAR-T, immunotherapy, but our population sciences are, I would say, unparalleled. And our solid tumor programs are really quite impressive right now. A prostate cancer spore, a lung cancer spore, previous breast and ovary cancer spores. I think that uh, the excellence across um, oncology um, is really impressive. And, and it, it was spawned by our expertise in bone marrow transplant. And we have learned the lessons that they had to teach us about the value of team science, and the importance of linking the laboratory and the clinic. Well, thank you so much. This is fascinating.